This week at church, Pastor Robin McKinley continues his series in James with Investing Faith. Believers are to give God as God provides for them. You can join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for free coffee, free baked goods, a worship service, and a sermon to follow. The church is located by the Coventry Mall on Laurelwood Road. We'll continue our series in James. So if you want to turn in James to James chapter uh, 5, and we'll start with verse 1. James chapter 5, verse 1. Now, James has been asking if our faith is authentic or if it's artificial. And as we've discussed in the first part of the letter, James is speaking to believers offering viable evidence to approve their faith. But in chapter 4, he begins to reprove those churchgoers whose faith was artificial. James talked about their faithlessness, how they create conflict, and they're judgmental, how they're defiant toward God's will. And today, we're going to talk about how they're greedy with God's blessings. James finishes his confrontation of the unsaved churchgoer by addressing how they handle money. So uh, James chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming to, on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Now this is tough stuff this morning. But in this passage, James takes dead aim at those who call themselves worshipers of God, but who are actually worshipers of money. Now, first of all, before we get going here, nobody admits to worshiping money, okay? But many people refuse to give because of ignorance, and I understand that. That's the way I was as an early Christian. I thought everything belonged to God, and I didn't give because of ignorance. My wife, well, when I married Cindy, she straightened me out in that real quick. And I'm not ignorant anymore about giving. <laughs> but uh, th that comes, th there are some that just don't give because of greed and self-centeredness. Some withhold because they want to send a message. But really the only message they're sending is that they're lost or carnal. The tithe is the Lord's. To mess with the tithe is to steal from God. Now in this text, James says money, more than anything, serves to determine the authenticity of a person's faith. Jesus said the same thing in Luke chapter 16, he talks about the shrewd manager. In Luke chapter 16, he says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. You see, the Pharisees were religious pretenders. They looked holy. They acted holy. 
people thought for sure they were holy, but yet in their heart, they weren't anything like they were showing on the outside. There can only be one priority in your life, and it's either got to be God or money. Godly people make God their priority. But for many people without God, the big G in their lives stands for greenbacks. And they spell God, M-O-N-E-Y. We have, in God we trust, Billy Graham says, on our coins. But me first, engraved in our hearts. The Bible speaks more about money than any other topic including salvation. Now, this morning, I'm not going to apologize for preaching on money. I do it about once a year. It just so happens to fit into this series that I'm doing right now. So I'm not a money-grubbing preacher. In fact, there are some times that I've, oh, we forgot re got to receive the offering. But I'm going to tell you more about God's economy later on. But I just want you to know that I'm not here to clean your wallet out today. I'm here to give you the biblical principles of what God tells us. You see, in Matthew chapter 6, the scripture says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If this is true, then we're in need for a heart transplant. Some of us are. If money is an obsession instead of a possession, then money has a hold on you. As we get started, I know that uh, talking about money is tough, but we're going to talk about it because the Bible does. So Paul tells Timothy in Timothy chapter 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world and we'll take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let me start by stating the obvious. God doesn't say money is bad. God says that money, the love of money, is the root of all kinds of evil. And it testifies against authentic faith. To love money is to be intoxicated and be driven by it. It's what you live for. In James chapter 5, to help us with the obsession of wealth, James distinguishes real faith from false faith. He says, your wealth has rotted. Your moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corro corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. So we're starting with your notes now, if you're following along with your notes. Authentic faith graciously circulates wealth. Artificial faith uselessly hoards wealth. Now let me talk about hoarding for just a moment. To hoard is to stockpile and eventually waste. You know, they have these reality shows on today, and one of the most detestable reality show, reality, rely, whatever they're called, shows that I have seen is this extreme hoarding. They, they put it on the TV at times, and man, I, I just can't stand to look at what people have done and how they've done it and what they have and why they have it. But you see, to have more than you need while others go without is a waste. 
Hoarding is treating wealth like it's eternal instead of temporary. God desires that we circulate his blessings rather than hoard them for ourselves. In James' day, wealth is measured by riches, garments, and metals. That's what we just read, okay? Luke tells us in his gospel, the rich man who stored up food in his barns, uh, let me, the rich man who stored up food in barns but died, full barns may give the appearance of wealth, but eventually they're going to rot. You know, we know a fellow in Kentucky who years ago, God had called him to the ministry. And he really didn't answer the call right away. He was a farmer in Kentucky. He had a banner crop. He had one of the best crops he ever had in his life. Now in Kentucky, you take your crop into the barns and you hang them up and, and let them dry out. And, and that particular crop, he hung it way too close to one another. It all rotted. I believe God was telling him he really needed to be in the ministry. But that's what we're talking about here. Food will rot. Crops will rot. Riches, general wealth. And back in this day, it was measured in food. That will rot. Garments. That's luxurious wealth. Wealth that can be passed on. People think clothes make the man or make the woman. Wealthy people would pass their clothes on as an inheritance. The problem is, after time, they will be eaten by moths. It's just the way it is. James says when it's all done, that they're not going to be there. And then there's metals, treasures to buy and sell with. Upon Christ's return, the money will be a useless commodity. And James it says they'll corrode. The bottom line is, if you spend your time piling up a fortune, that will mean nothing when you step into eternity. Take the blessings God gives you. Use them for his glory to minister to people and meet them at their point of need as God has met you at your point of need. Here's what Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. What does the millionaire, what, what's the millionaire's next project? I'm talking about the worldly millionaire because God can bless people. Millionaires, they can be saved and they can be good stewards of what God has given them. So remember, money isn't evil. It's the root of the love for money that's the root of all evil. So... The, the millionaire who's out for money, the, the, he wants the next million. You know, someone told me one time, said, the first million is the hardest to get. It's the second one that's easy, so I'm going after the second one. It's not working. Okay, I just want to let you know that. All right, let's move on. James says, the wages you fail to pay the way workers who mowed your field are crying out against you. So point B is, authentic faith honorably acquires wealth. Artificial faith sinfully steals wealth. James is addressing the issue of the rich exploiting and cheating the poor for their own indulgence, for their own control. But to obtain wealth is... Uh, in a dishonest way, is ungodly. So it's, it's not just the person who's paying, but it's the person who's working. Like drawing a paycheck without diligently working your job, doing your job. It's like obtaining wealth by stealing and manipulating others. Or it's like obtaining wealth by stealing the tithe from God. The only acceptable means of obtaining wealth is by following God's instruction of hard work, faithful steward, stewardship, and trust in God. James goes on to say, if you've lived on the earth in luxury and self-endurance, you have fattened yourself in the day of sl slaughter. 
Authentic faith selflessly invests wealth. Artificial faith selfishly misuses wealth. The word luxury here is a word that means to live softly. James was referring to living a delicate and extravagant life at the expense of others. The word indulge, this says self-indulgence or indulgence, means to passionately pursue and to lead a life of motive, uh, motiveless pleasure, plunging headlong into wastefulness. You know, you've seen these, these movies where they, they'll rob a bank and they'll throw the money up in the air and they'll spend it on this and that and that. It's full, full of wastefulness and what happens at the end of the movie, they get caught. That's life. That's the way life works. You get caught. If it isn't by somebody here, it's God. Amen. And then the word fattened. It says, you have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. Fattened. It's like a pig hogging the trough. He doesn't realize he's getting plumped up for the slaughter. It's, it's the idea of a thief who has gorged himself on the plunder of others. The problem with the person who makes money their God is they only want to spend it on themselves. The problem arose when they came to believe that they owned it. It is mine, and I can use it any way I please, rather than recognizing what I have has been given to me by God, and it belongs to God. And we must be stewards of his blessing. Well, James goes on to say, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. So point, uh, the fourth point on this is authentic faith gratefully manages wealth. Artificial faith ruthlessly maintains wealth. It's a downward sparrow ending with people doing what it takes to keep what they have. They're willing to steal from God, steal from others, and some will even kill, if necessary, to retain their lifestyle. You see, obsessing wealth always leads to a dead end. We were created to live for more than just money. We were created to live for more than just comfort. Yet money makes the world go round and we need to understand how to process money without it possessing us. So we're going to go to point two. See, point two should have been point one, but I wanted to end with point this point. Possessing wealth. So let me begin this point by saying that God understands the need and the power of money. He understands that we need money to live by. We need money for ministry. I mean, this morning we flipped the lights on. The reason we were able to flip the lights on is because we needed money to pay the light bill so that we would have lights in here and we would have a sound system and we would have everything that we need in this building. We also need money to help people to go into ministry, um, to commission you to do the things to, for our ministries that happen on Wednesday nights. We need money to, to do all this kind of stuff. So God understands that. We understand this. Yet money must never become the God that we pursue. We read earlier, money isn't evil. It's what we do with money that can be evil. You know, they, they've got this. I won't get into that. That's too political. We must learn how to manage money and use it. Or it will drive us. Greed is a sign of an unregenerate heart, while generosity is a sign that you're walking in the Lord. So let's answer some questions about giving. The first question is, how am I to give? How am I to give? We're not to give out of our wealth by tipping God, but give according to our wealth. We're to give in 
appreciation of what God has done for us. See, there are three reasons that people give. They give out of fear of punishment. They give out of a desire for a reward. And they give out of a grateful heart of love. So, how am I to give? That's the question. The first word that comes to my mind is proportionately. God gets the first and the best tenth of your income. This is God's economy. It goes way back to before the law. Now people say, well, tithing, that's an Old Testament thing. We don't have to do that. And uh, they say it's under the law. No, it goes back before the law. Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek way before the law. And then the law is set up, and here's God's economy. The priests did their job, and people brought the best of their flock to God, gave it to the priest. He used some of it on the altar, and some of it he kept for himself. That was God's economy. And it continues to the New Testament. Jesus said, I, I haven't abolished that. I want it to get better now. I want you to give up 10% to where? Where you're getting fed, the local church. You know, if God's economy is going to work, it's got to be everybody is participating in his economy. And as people participate in the economy, you know, we could take care of the needs of those outside of the church, the needs of those inside of the church. We could take care of the church building. We could take care of ministry. We could take care of, that's God's economy. And he knew it was going to work if everyone participated. So we give proportionably. One person said, well, how much is a tenth? Well, if you have $10, you move the decimal point over one uh, spot, and you give a dollar. If you have $100, you move the de decimal spot over one, and you give $10. It's 10%. So here's, here's what's happened in our generation. You see, we give 10%, we have 90% left. Of course, Uncle Sam is going to take his cut, and we'll, we'll be real conservative with this, and we'll say that he took 20%, so now you have 70% left. If you're a wise steward, you're putting 10% away as a savings or a retirement. So now you have 60% left. And many of uh, families today are living beyond their means and they're in debt, credit card debt. I'm not talking about house. I'm talking about credit card debt. And there's another 20% leaving us to live on 40% of our income. The problem is we're not making it work. So because it's not working, we take from God because we know that God will understand. Okay? Because we can't take from Uncle Sam. If we take from Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam will throw us in jail. One person said, better jail than hell. Because the scripture says, Thieves and robbers will not make it into the kingdom of God. So, the problem isn't necessarily a money issue. It's a wants and a management issue. We never have learned, we, we have never learned to live within our means. And we have neglected God's guidelines for managing money and how we're upside down and we don't know how to get right side up. It begins with handling money according to the precepts of the Bible. So the question is, how do we give? The first word is proportionately. The second word is consistently. Believers are to give God as God provides for them. The third word is sacrificially. Above and beyond the tithe. And that's what we'll be doing next week. Next week, we'll, we'll, we'll be asking you to uh, tell us what you trust God to provide for you to give for missions. That's beyond the tithe. That's giving sacrificially. And then the fourth word is joyfully. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. 
Now, there was a church in Kentucky, a small church in Kentucky, that they used to applaud when they received the offering because they wanted everyone to be joyful. A, a ritual they had in South Africa was they danced as they went up. They, they didn't receive the offering like we do. The ushers didn't go to them. The, the, I think one of them was just a box, wasn't it? It was right up front. They danced and sang, and people brought their offering up to the Lord, and they put it in the box. They gave joyfully. But cheerfulness isn't a command. You can't say, well, I'm not going to give today because I just don't feel cheerfully. No, no. It says God loves a cheerful giver, okay? But God loves obedience more than anything else. So God wants us to give obediently. Make no mistake about it. God wants, to give, wants you to give out of a heart of love. But if you're going to give begrud begrudgingly, at least you're not letting your wallet take control of your life. And give begrudgingly if you have to. Give begrudgingly instead of stealing from God in disobedience. So the scripture tells us what we're to give to God. What am I to give to God? The tithe. We don't give God the tithe, we pay the tithe. The first tenth given in obedience to the mandate of God. Offering gifts above and beyond the tithe would be like our missions offering. And then there's giving by faith. And some people will say, God, this is what I need. And I'm not buying this. I'm just giving out of my need by faith so this would happen. There's the term seed money. I don't particularly care for that term because it's, it's been made a very, very bad word with televangelists. Some of them, that's all they preach is seed money. No, no, that's, there is a thing as, as, as seed money, but it's third compared to the tithe and the offerings. Now, God isn't trying to hold you up. He's not trying to hold you up this morning. I'm not trying to hold you up. God isn't trying to take what you have. No, God, God is zealous for his people. He's zealous for his people to trust him and to support the work of his kingdom but let me assure you he isn't as concerned about your giving as he is about your heart he wants your heart to be pure hallelujah friends if money has your heart then jesus doesn't a christ-like life is possessed by god in all areas, starting with our wallet. You know, you can tell how committed a person is to Christ by looking at two things, their wallet and their date book, their calendar. You see, in Luke chapter 16, there was a rich man on Lazarus. Greed caused the rich man to miss God's grace because he was so busy seeking earthly treasures that he missed out on God's heavenly gifts. The man didn't grasp how the pursuit of money cost him his soul. So what does your giving say about your faith? Does it say you are faithful or does it say you are faithless?